Why, hello! I'm Natalie Zett, and welcome to Flower in the River. Flower in the River is a podcast about a book I wrote of the same name. And that book is about the Eastland disaster that took place in 1915 in Chicago and how that long-ago tragedy affected my family for generations. I'll talk about writing and family history and what to do when the supernatural comes into your life when you're innocently doing a family history research project. Come on and let's have some fun with this. Hey, it's Natalie, and welcome back to part two of our chat with Barb Decker Wachholz. Barb is a co founder of the Eastland Disaster Historical Society, and today she'll spill the beans on how the society got its start. If you missed the first episode, go listen ASAP because it's all about Barb's incredible grandma, Bobby Onstead. Bobby survived the Eastland disaster, and trust me, you don't want to miss Barb's storytelling chops because they are superb. Quick rundown for those just jumping in. The main players are Bobby Onstead, originally born as Borghild Onstead. That's Barb's grandma. She, along with her mom, Marianne, her little sister, Solvig, and Uncle Olaf were all on the Eastland, and they all survived. Now, Bobby wasn't the quiet type. <laughs> she shared this gripping tale of survival with her grandkids, inspiring the eventual creation of the Eastland Disaster Historical Society. In this episode, you will learn more about the co-founders of EDHS. They are Barb decker Wachholz, Susan Decker, their late mother, Jean Decker, and Barb's husband, Ted Wachholz. They're the brains and the heart behind the society. So take a listen and find out what happens when a family story turns into something much, much bigger. We continue with the interview with Barb decker Wachholz. There's a transition, though, between having something like that in your history and creating a society. What happened? I mean, that's a lot of work, Barb. You know, I mean, you know more than anybody. It's not just like me putting my little book here. You know, that was a lot of work. But this is, you've changed the history of the Eastland because you did this. And how did that alchemy happen? Well, it's interesting because my grandma died in 1991. She was 90. And so the years went by and literally in 1997, I mean, we had started to talk about it a little bit, you know, and Ted, again, Ted married into this. He grew Mm -hmm. up in Elgin, which is Mm -hmm. another Northwest suburb. He had never heard about it until he came into the family. You know, and he said, wow, you know, I, I, I don't live that far away from the city. And I, I had, he, so he had no, no clue about it. Anyway, he was intrigued by it. But uh, so again, the years went by and we started talking about it. And actually, I think it was, nine, it might've been 1995, actually, I'll backtrack. He, being curious about the Eastland, he happened to see that a man by the name of George Hilton had mm-hmm. written a book on the Eastland. And he thought, wow, hmm, this is interesting. And so anyway, Ted and I used to love to go down to the city a lot. We sometimes would go down, you know, for a night, go see a show, stay overnight somewhere. Anyway, we were down there one weekend in 95. And he said, let's let's go to a, a bookstore. And I want to see if I can find the book. Because he thought that would be really neat to read. So anyway, long story short, we went into, I can remember going into this one bookstore, kind of a smaller one, not a, not a big Barnes and Noble. But anyway they have their computer there and you're inquiring about a book. And I said, I'm looking for a book on on the Eastland disaster by George Hilton. And, you know, she kind of looked, she had never heard about it, never heard about that. So she's looking it up and I can't remember if we purchased it there, but I feel like we went into a couple of bookstores and anyway, no one had heard of the Eastland disaster. And so again, long story short, Ted does wind up obtaining the book and Ted's a, 
a very intelligent man and technical. But he said, this book was so technical. He said, boy, there were times I had to kind of reread some of this stuff because George Hilton just wrote a very explicit book about what happened. And so that was in 1995. And we actually bought that book for my mom, even though my mom is the daughter-in-law. My dad had already passed at that mm -hmm. time. Uh, but anyway, somehow Ted ordered it and he had George Hilton autograph it. But anyway, so that's in 95. And then Ted's wheels are spinning. Okay. And even though Susan and I are the, well, he calls it the heart and soul behind the Eastland because of my gra our grandma. We've got that blood connection to her. He just started to think about this. And he said, you know, as the years go on and we start losing, losing perhaps survivors who are out there that we don't know about, he said, you know, and in talking to people, so many people don't know about this. He said, he said, maybe we should do something about it. So in 1997, we were traveling to Merrillville, Indiana, to his aunt's house for Thanksgiving. She always hosted big Thanksgiving, had 35 people there, the whole family. In the car on the way with my, uh, my mom joined us at that time, my mom and my sister and Ted and I, he said, you know what, I, th I, think, we I think we need to do something. He said, I think we should form a, a not-for-profit historical society about the Eastland. And let's, let's do something to preserve this. He said, because as these year, the years go on, it's going to just be gone. Because again, so many people don't know about it. For the city of Chicago to hardly ever recognize this, you know, it, it's just so odd. It's so odd. Anyway, so you know, I'll, I'm just condensing this quite a bit. So we thought, wow, this all this all happened in talking on the way to Thanksgiving dinner, and then in 1998, we we went through all the processes to form the society, and then Ted, being the techie guy that he is, he formed a one page, a one page little website. You you got to start somewhere, right? And uh, so he got that going, and then it seemed like before long we would start getting hits on our website. And, and we had a special phone number for Eastland for those business calls. And then through a short amount of time, we started to hear from different people who said, you know, my, my grandfather was, was on the Eastland. And so many different stories of survival, of people who did not survive, descendant of a firefighter who was there on the scene, or funeral director who took care of many. We started to hear from so many. And I cannot tell you how many family stories we have, files, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. So it's really quite amazing. And so 25 years later, we have a, a, a great brand working with a branding company to we've, we've upgraded through the years. And we've gone from giving presentations, we, we look back now, and we kind of chuckle at our very first presentations were with an overhead projector with the transparent sheets. Yeah. And now we have, you know, now we have animation of the ship and it's so realistic looking and we've just really come a long way with this, but we've met so many amazing people. And, and I don't know if I'm jumping ahead here oh, a little bit because well, the... you were, you had inquired too about, you know, maybe the, the future of the, the memories of, of these people and the future mm -hmm. of EDHS and, Ted and I have said, and my sister, that we're in our mid 60s now. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to age out as far as we're retired now, but it's always been a volunteer thing for us. We have two grown children who are both mm -hmm. married, absolutely wonderful, wonderful human beings. And mm -hmm. they have been so supportive of what we've done through the years with Eastland. And they have been involved to a certain degree and they love what we're doing, but they have their own careers and their own lives. And this is not something that they will take on themselves going forward. So it's easy to say, well, okay, we've, we've done it for 25 years, but the thought of just closing up would be, to me, to all of us, would be devastating. And I think it would be devastating to the people with whom we've connected through the years. And it would be devastating to the memory and the honor of people who have perished in the tragedy. Anyway, so we thought there's no way that we can just close up shop. So currently, Ted and a business partner, they do have a succession plan. I should say we do, but Ted is, is working with this other person. And it's called Your Next Chapter. 
and still kind of actively working on this succession plan. And it will someday be something that would be staffed and self-sustaining. All the family files. Someday we will be gone. And again, we've got all of this information that we want to, you know, we want it to be preserved and we want to be able to share that information. So we want people to be able to obtain whatever information they they need on family members and all their stories should still be preserved. The Newberry Library has all the archives. Okay. It's archival. They will have a lot of photos and documents that will be Mm -hmm. preserved there. And so info, all this information that will be at the Newberry, it would, it will eventually then be available for anybody here and out. So they're, they're working together with Mm -hmm. this. Okay. uh, So still kind of in a state of working on this and defining, okay, got it. I was, thank you. You cleared that up for me. So, okay. Yeah. So that's, but that's wonderful. And again, you because you've been living it for 25 years, you probably don't realize the service that you've done for people like, I think I found you right when your website popped up because there was another guy called Carl Sup who right. had the Eastland Memorial, Memorial. Society. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I can't believe I remember that. And then, then you popped up because I was in a state of confusion. I thought, Eastland, what? My family, who? I mean, I was that, I was like, I was, I was in shock. So trying to okay. figure out what had happened and yeah. that you were doing this. I thought, wow, then I met Ted at some restaurant in Schaumburg. This was like, okay. yeah, like right around that time. So it was like the time you were brand new and I was brand new. And okay. yep, that's yeah. what happened. Yeah. A couple different societies out there. So we, yeah, we are. Our you lasted, society. you outlasted them yeah. all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. Why, why did you outlast them all? I mean, this is hard work. And not just your story, but all of our stories, you have brought us all together. But how'd you do it, Barb? How did you all keep steady? And also, too, for a family organization, I've tried to work with relatives. Let's just say not so much. It has not worked (laughs) out. So that's admirable. And I so tell me, what's the secret? Yeah, that's true. I I mean, I know that there are some where, you know, it it wouldn't work for some families. I guess Mm. we're just very, very blessed. I mean, Mm. my sister and I are very close, so we get along great. I I think it's just a, I guess, just a driving passion. I would have to say with Ted being our executive director, with his background, again, Mm -hmm. very intelligent man, and Mm -hmm. and yes, he's my husband. Mm. But, you know, he also has a finance background and his IT background. Yeah, so Uh he's He's able to, you know, his corporate experience has Mm -hmm. helped him. But you were talking about Ted, the 25 years, and the fact that this synchronicity, synergy, alchemy that you have together is, it just happened. But the fact that you were able to carry this fire this far, and again, I'm not sure you realize what you've done for all of us. Oh, oh, (laughs) well, you're you're welcome. I mean, I'm glad that we have, we, we do get just some wonderful feedback from, from families and people who have said, Oh my gosh, I'm, we're so glad that you're doing this. And so many people who have contacted us who actually never knew that they mm-hmm. had a relative on the Eastland or they were going through an attic and finding some newspapers. Mm-hmm. We still to this day get either a phone call or an mm-hmm. email from someone who has a connection. So that's yeah. really quite amazing. What is your theory? I mean, people always ask me when I'm on a radio show or a podcast, why was it forgotten? I don't, maybe that's not the right question, but what do you think, Barb? Well, that's okay, because a lot of people ask us this. They ask us, especially you know, when we have a, a Q&A after one of our presentations, mm-hmm. we always open it up for Q&A. That's the first question, yep. yep. It really, it, and it, inevitably, there's always there are always questions, and oftentimes there's someone in the audience who has a connection, which is mm-hmm. all we always ask, too. But so many times people will say, why do you think... This has been forgotten. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, we honestly, we, with all the knowledge that we have of Eastland and all the research we've done, that is something that I don't even think we can answer. Mm-hmm. And we will really say, you know what, it's, it's a great question, but we really don't know why. Now, the fact that at the time that happened, I mean, we, we do have so many old newspaper headlines that are mm-hmm. archived here. And, you know, it was internationally known. It went across the world, a horrible, horrible tragedy like that. 
But then shortly, shortly around that time or shortly after World War One erupted. And then all of a sudden in the headlines, of course, then it's more World War One. Mm -hmm. And then it just sort of started to kind of fade away. The fact though, I mean, I can see internationally that over time, I mean, sadly, these disasters happen and you hear about it and it's, oh my gosh, that's horrific. That's horrible. And even to this day, and then slowly things kind of fade away. But the fact that Chicago, one yes. of the biggest cities in the world, Chicago, Chicago. <laughs> kind of seemed to brush it under the rug is something we just still don't understand. For so many years, I don't think they wanted, they didn't want to bring attention to it, which is really kind of strange. It's history. It's history. Yeah. It's not a reflection of the city itself. Well, Chicago's got a few right? other things there, Barb. They've got a lot of- <laughs> I was going to say, there's a few they- things that went on in Chicago that are like- I know. Uh, I know. Yeah, it's like really the- interesting. I just wondered what you, after all your wisdom, but I have no, I have less answers now than I once did. I, I think know. a lot of it had to do with the population, working class immigrant children of immigrant mm-hmm. I've always have said that but that's mm-hmm. it's almost too easy to default to that and I'm not quite sure if it right. was just and then families like mine I didn't even write about the real trauma that happened afterwards I mean the fact that mm-hmm. there was some very very bad things that happened mm-hmm. post because there was nothing really to help them with the mental issues that arose from all of that and they suffered and that's and, so the, and the trauma got transferred down the line Absolutely. And we've we've talked about that too. Sometimes in mm. presentations when this comes up, that has come up too, where we've heard that, you know, there was the, the grandpa said or the the great uncle said, We will we are not gonna talk about this. It was so horrific. And I think, wow, can you imagine? I'm sure there were families that did talk about it. But you know, it's interesting <laughs> to hear that, you know, or you hear, you know, sometimes you hear stories about men who came home from the war. Mm -hmm. They won't talk about it. it. Yeah, Didn't want to bring that up. And it's just, it's just very interesting. I wish we had an answer. Uh, I don't either. Think about like the Titanic. Of course, everybody knows about the Titanic. Everybody knows about that. The glamour of that. Yeah, we're not so glamorous, you know, but. You know, hardworking immigrants. It doesn't mean their lives were any less, less value. It's not that. I don't even think it had anything to do with that. But I just don't, I really, I, I don't think we really know why. I guess we never will, right? It's just one of those mysteries to hold on to. Um, I have found it interesting. Uh, Of the schools, a lot of the junior highs, Mm -hmm. sometimes even elementary, maybe fifth, sixth, seventh grade, the kids do history fairs. And it it was interesting through the years, we would get even a a 12-year-old who would email us and say, I'm doing my project. I want to do my project, my history fair project on the Eastland disaster. Can you help? So we would help and we would talk and we would email you know, and then we've also had a few teachers through the years contact us. And I was talking to one on the phone many years ago, and she taught in the city. And she said, I am actually embarrassed to say I'm a teacher, and I have never heard of this. And I will be teaching my students. Mm-hmm. And so again, for some of those kids who do history fair, then then in turn, when they're presenting, they're, they're getting word out too about, about the Eastland and it's just, it's you, really a travesty. You've done more than you realize. I think you probably touch more than you realize. And I don't. I was going to ask you this. Have you gotten a lot of questions from across the pond? Because that's what's happening to me from Have you? England, that's great. Ireland. Oh, and to answer your question. So mm-hmm. that's interesting that you've heard from people across the pond oh, too. Oh, quite a and, few. And we have also. Yeah. And we wound up, oh gosh, there's a, a, a lovely family in Ireland. And her family, she had a connection and lost two of her grand aunts. And she and her family did come in for the big 100th anniversary. And she was part of the uh, documentary. And but just, it's really amazing, again, how there are people all over the world that have a connection to this in some way. There probably are so many that don't even know that there's a connection to it. Well, with yeah. all those people, there's, there's probably more that we haven't even hit yet, but it's interesting to hit it in different ways. I mean, not to, I feel like I've, I'm, I'm doing it in a different way. Cause it's like, you've, you've borne the burden of this. It's like, I got to do my part here. And so get it out there and do what I can. But I always refer people back to you just so you know that. <laughs> just like, Well, that's so nice. And you know what I was to. just thinking, going back to yeah. what you said, you know, you, you would maybe not be here had the circumstances been different, nor would I. And we even say that in part of our presentation, part of our program, you know, Mm -hmm. the picture of my grandma with her family around that time. 
And, you know, have always said that if our grandmother hadn't survived, we wouldn't be here with you today. Yeah, it's, and so it's kind of an odd feeling when it's you a really weird feeling. how, how fate, how, you know, it's just meant to be. And uh, I think about that too, that my father would not have survived mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. my sister and I would not have, Ted and I have two children, mm -hmm. Rhonda would not exist. So it's so weird to think. Yeah. It's just interesting. It is. It was the motivator for me when I when I finally was able to put the pieces together. I thought my great aunt shouldn't have been on that. It should have been my grandmother. My great aunt wasn't the Western Electric employee. So when I finally found her grave at Bethania, I said, "I owe you one." Oh, isn't yeah? Isn't that something? Oh, that's well, giving me goosebumps just hearing you say well, that. Well, it was. Well, I mean, like I said, there's a fair amount of the stuff that I talked oh. about in the book. So I thought there's something about this event. It's like at first I really didn't believe anyone would read that book because it's about my family and it was only meant for family. But they are reading it and their lives are being changed. Some of them. But look at how many people you have reached. I, I it's am really touched it, and made them think about things. And because of, again, because of my mother's older sister, though, because she was the one who did the family history and said, I can't, I've kept this in long enough. She was in her eighties and she was a reporter, I think for the Chicago Herald in the thirties. And she said, I got to, I've got to give this to you before I go. Wasn't that something for you to, to read? It that? was, it was, it was also, but it wasn't necessarily what I told people. It wasn't a joyous thing. It was like, I'm too late. Oh. It was a tremendous feeling of guilt. I'm guessing, too, that in order to let this story live, that a lot of life as you knew it had to recede a bit. And that's what you've done. You've been of tremendous service, humbly. I mean, again, I know Ted better than I know you, but I mean, Ted is like, what the heck? How does this guy keep doing this stuff? I know. <laughs> but it's just like, but yes, he is. He's... He's 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 brilliant, but he's also <laughs> so compassionate. He he's is. got such he a is. beautiful heart, and so yes, do you. Sure. I think what you have done is tremendous. Is there anything that I've not asked you? Anything that you've been dying to talk about? I'm I'm here. So what would you like to say? Uh, well, you know what I'd like to say just a little bit about about my grandma. And again, yeah. I sometimes feel like there aren't enough adjectives. To Everybody so. who met her loved her. All of our, you know, the cousins and, and everybody, she, everybody loved Aunt Bobby, you know, and oh through God. the years, she just, she loved to have fun. I, I think you've maybe seen some of the pictures when she mm, was she's young. Beautiful. She's beautiful. She's on the beach. Yes, so lawn, cute. You know, laughing, oh the smile. And that was after the disaster. I'm thinking she was about 16. Then. But what I remember about her, and I feel so blessed to have had her until I was in my, was my early 30s, something like that, was the memories that I have of her and her, her zest for life. You know, you think about a young girl who has gone through uh, some of these horrible childhood illnesses and survived mm -hmm. to lose her father, who she loved Aww. and adored. Yeah. And I remember her telling me he loved music. He loved hmm. music. I remember that. I wish I knew more about him, but to lose him when you're 10 years old, and then three years later, you're fighting for your life in this ship, and then you still go on, and you're, you're living your life, you're laughing, you're, you're enjoying your life, and it's like she just had this gusto for life, even oh though goodness. she had a lot of trauma in her life. What I learned from her, I guess, when looking at my life and and I and I do have to say, and I'm, mm. I'm not just saying this, but my my own mom has always said, she said, "You're so much like Nana." And I think I feel that, you know, mm -hmm. from the time I was little, my mom said I was born smiling, I was, you know, laughing, laughing. Mm -hmm. So, and there's just a lot. Or I, I can remember, uh, you know, even when I was in my 40s, I would tell my mom, "Oh gosh, I was working, I was doing this project at home, and I'm this. I haven't sat down all day." She said oh my gosh, I don't know how you do it. You're just like Nana. She mm -hmm. could take on a project mm -hmm. and, you know, so I, and I feel like I have her personality. I, I, I'm I saying this because I feel blessed. So when I think of life, life isn't always, always happy, go lucky. And we all have, can have trauma in our life and we can have sadness and, and things don't maybe always go the way we hope. What I've learned 
and what I, what I take from her is her spirit. And I think, okay, maybe that's not going the way I want it to go or whatever has happened in the past. You just keep on living. You keep on laughing. And I have some of her letters and, you know, written letters, of course. And I was reading them not so long ago. And I just, they're just lovely, sweet letters. But I remember like there was a little PS and she said something like, always, always be happy. And, you know, she was just, uh, she was just inspiring. I think, you know, I look at pictures of her. I'm going to send it to you because I don't okay. know if you have it. Okay. Um, it's, I have it as a five by seven in a frame on okay. a, a beautiful little table that she got in 1921. It's a mm -hmm. hundred, you know, it's over a hundred years old. She got when it was a wedding gift. Oh, wow. So I have it. I love it. Anyway, it was a picture of her in her seventies. And there is something I do want to possibly wrap up with that mm -hmm. you probably know about, but I, I didn't touch on it yet. She's in her seventies. She's got the biggest smile on her face, her cute little short haircut. Mm -hmm. And it's that same smile that you see in the pictures of her when she's a teenager or a young married woman. It's that beautiful brightness that she mm -hmm. had. And so I have just, again, I'm blessed to, to have her genetic makeup but I think there are times where if I do feel kind of whatever, I just think of her and her telling you, just be happy, be happy. You know, in other words, life is good, except, you know, just you got to go forward. You got to just have a zest for life and just be happy. And um, what I did want to just reflect on just real fast, I'll go back. I mentioned about Ernie Carlson mm -hmm. when she was young with the family friends up in Wisconsin. And so, you know, they're young kids and probably teenagers at that point. And then obviously they grow up and life moves on. My grandmother married my grandfather, my dad's father. And then Ernie went on to get married and, and had a son, wound up living out in California. He was widowed and then married again. Okay. And then he was widowed for a second time. Okay. My grandma, Bobby, was widowed in 1965, as I mentioned. I uh, had her cute little apartment on the northwest side of Chicago and was a, a wonderful cook. She loved to entertain. That's another thing that I love to do. A wonderful baker. I'm actually going to send you a cookie recipe of hers that I think Please you do. will love. love everybody, it. everybody who has it says, I have I mean, to have that recipe. You'll love it. Love so it that anymore. has carried on too. But anyway, so she was widowed in 1965. About 10 years later in 75, still living in the same cute apartment, and we're still out in the suburbs, I'm in high school, she receives a letter in the mail from Ernie Carlson. All these years later, they're, they're in their 70s. They haven't seen each other since they're teenagers, okay? So long story short, and I'm sure you know this story, he was coming into Chicago and you know had heard that she had been widowed for a while. And and thought maybe it would be nice to get together. I have that letter. It was a card. I have that card packed in her little box of things. So it's really special. And so anyway, to condense and long story short, I think they met up at a one of the lovely hotels in Chicago in, in the restaurant, you know, one of, one of those nice restaurants. And anyway, they just hit it off. Can you imagine seeing each other after all those years? Yeah, and yeah. you had crushed those little, you know, it's like those little crushes you have. They had never, they didn't date. They weren't girlfriend and boyfriend, but they were, you know. Anyway, as it turns out, a year later, they get married. And they got married at the church where I was confirmed in the suburbs in Arlington Heights. And um, his son and wife flew in from California. We got to know the family and they really became like our other family. And I'm still in touch with, with Ernie's grandsons, wonderful people. And we had the most beautiful wedding reception in my parents' backyard. It was a beautiful wow. summer day. It was the summer before I went into senior year of high school. And what's so amazing is we knew at that time that, you know, when she definitely said she would get, she would marry him. She was going to then be moving to California oh, after coming here when she was three, living in Chicago, you know, living on her own, you know, for 10 years since she had been widowed. And I was like, no, nah, no, you're going to you're going to leave and you're going to go to California. But we were so happy for her. And as it turns out, she had seven wonderful years with Ernie. She had more fun and he was cute and silly and funny. We just mm -hmm. loved him. And they had a lovely little place in Brea, 
California, near where his son lived. And she got to know their family. They loved her like their other grandma. So, and then he passed away in his mm-hmm. sleep in 1983. And then my parents went out, we went out for the funeral and then wound up moving my grandma back. Well, and then I, I, so she did say, she said those were the seven best years of her life. And I thought it was so interesting. Oh. You know, I, I know she loved my grandpa, yeah. but I think Ernie, there was something about Ernie that was so fun and Ernie. silly and fun. And, and also here's a little uh, tidbit. They went on a, a few cruises. So here again, she survives the Eastland when she's a teen, had no qualms about going on a cruise. Oh they went God. to Hawaii. She did so many things she had never done in the years she was married to my grandpa. You know, it was more of a, a meager. They lived very yeah. comfortably, but she had a great seven years with Ernie. And then if if I can, I'll just wrap up here a little oh, bit. No, keep talking. She, keep talking, Barb. When she, when she passed, she was at that time then living with my mom and dad the past, like the last couple of years of her life. She had a little congestive heart failure, very common, of course. But other than that, I mean, she she didn't walk with a walker. She still had her mental faculties. You know, she'd be at the sink helping my mom with the dishes and, you know, all that. But but had a couple little instances, you know, with her heart, just a little bit. We had a beautiful 90th birthday party for her on her birthday, July 28th. And oh, wow. that was in nine. Everybody who was invited came. And you know how when you plan a party, there's always going to be someone who can't make it, right? I mean, or they're sick or they, they already had a vacation plan. Oh, I can't make it, whatever. Everybody who was invited, Whoa. all the friends, all her friends, our dear family friends, everybody who loved her family. Beautiful day in my parents' backyard, just like when uh, she had married Ernie in 1976. Anyway, so we've got even video footage of that. I love it. She's welcoming everybody. And she's just, it was a beautiful, beautiful celebration of her, her life, 90. So five days later, she passed in her sleep. And it was, it was, I mean, it was shocking because we were like, oh my gosh, you know, we just had her party five days ago, but it was very peaceful. It was in her sleep. My mom went in to check on her and she's, you know, my mom knew her patterns and um, she went in to check on her at about eight in the morning. She thought, oh, she should be up by about now. And, you know, she went around to the side of the bed and she was just sleeping there so peacefully Mm -hmm. or she thought, and then she knew she could tell, but you know what? She she did not suffer at all. And even the paramedics, when they came, they said, you know, her heart just slowly just stopped. And, and, you know, it's so interesting because then two days after that, a week from the time we had the party for her, one, exactly one week later then, we were at the wake. And so everybody who had been at the party a week before, you know, was there and we were all saying, isn't it hard to believe that a week ago today we were celebrating her? And, you know, with everybody who had attended the party, we said it was meant to be that way because they were all there to say goodbye. Not knowing, not knowing, but that she could even see everybody. And it was just like this wonderful celebration of her, her life. And, and uh, so it really was amazing. But I, I have often said, Oh, my gosh, I hope that when my time comes, I just, I fall asleep like my grandma, you know, what a special, special lady. But yeah, (laughs) I feel as if I've met her through you. And I really feel like the storytelling gene is alive and well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank I'm you. honored to, to talk about her. I love talking about oh, her. Oh, you can talk then. about her anytime. I could just sit here and just like, let me get some coffee and just listen. <laughs> it's, really, it's really intriguing for oh. me to hear you talk about somebody who survived. And I actually felt with your story, I felt like I was there. I got an insight, insight to what that time on the Eastland was like. I've never really, I mean, I've seen the videos. I've seen the stories. This is the first time I felt like, okay, this was from somebody who was actually there. Oh, what happened to Uncle Olaf after all that? That's a good question. You know what actually. happened to him? He, yeah, he actually, and I don't remember how long he stayed with them. See, gosh, I actually have pictures in all of my grandma's things of Olaf. He did marry a woman. Her mm-hmm. name was Bess. And they moved out to California. Oh. However, I don't know if he met her here or if he met her in California. And he had a farm out in California. And so even when my dad was young, that we have vacation pictures of them out 
at Uncle Olaf's farm with animals. And um, wow. my dad was, oh gosh, it looked like he was maybe, you know, eight, 10, something like that. And pictures with Olaf. The only picture I recall of Olaf as a young man was the family portrait that mm -hmm. we do have of them. Seen that, yeah. uh, otherwise, in these other pictures, uh, you know, he's an older man mm -hmm. and, and uh, a little heavier. And mm -hmm. but it, I, you know, that's Uncle Olaf. Um, and to my knowledge, I remember my my grandma and mm -hmm. my mom actually saying that they had had a child, and but the child was born. Well, you know, it's Down syndrome. They oh, didn't okay, call sure, it Down sure. syndrome at that time. Mm -hmm. But that's about all I know. They were in California. In so. California. Wow. And I was trying to think there was something else I was going to mention to you about Uncle. Oh, just a little kind of a silly thing about Uncle sure. Olaf, a, sure. a story that mm -hmm. I remember. You know, I mentioned to you that when we were kids, she would tell us all the funny it, these stories about when she was young. And so mm -hmm. we, we loved those. We have her repeat them, as I mentioned. So there was a story about, and this is after her father had died. And when she came home from school, because Uncle Olaf was living there. And at that okay. point, then her mom had to go out to work. So when she came home from school, she had to put on, I remember this one day, she said she had to peel the potatoes and put them on the stove. But then she had a friend over and, you know, she didn't pay attention to the potatoes on the stove. So they, you know, all the water evaporated. They burned. Oh, no. oh, <laughs> she no. said when Uncle <laughs> Olaf came home. Yeah, she said he was so mad. He was so mad. <laughs> but anyway, it's just you know, just some of those little silly stories. things and mm -hmm. little stories and mm -hmm. and and these are just little little silly little things. And and you certainly don't have to keep these in your your podcast. Oh, I think here, I think those are the things that we remember when things don't go well. Like my the year my mom dropped the Thanksgiving turkey on the floor and she said, "Ah, just clean it up." You know, those are the things oh, we remember, so not the perfect Martha do, Stewart. Right? Yeah, it's just when things get messed up, it's just like that's yeah. funny. I mean, those are really funny. That is that is so true. No, this was just, you know, when I told you the little story about that Bobby Blix and how she mm -hmm, yeah. you know, pennies. And I do also remember and this is what I loved when she would tell us stories about herself. And it's like, I could always picture. And I mean, still at this day, I'm 63 and I can still picture what I picture in my head from what she told me when she, you know, we were young and she would talk about how she loved to roller skate. You know, I love to roller skate up and down the sidewalk. And I'm thinking, wow, you were in Logan square. I'm picturing, you know, we've been through Logan square. It's mm -hmm. like, Oh my gosh, you know, this cute girl roller skating. And then she, she told us about a time she was at their house and she was being silly because she was silly mm -hmm. and she was imitating Charlie Chaplin. Oh my. And she had a little cane, she had some kind of a stick and you know how he would twirl, mm -hmm. he would walk yeah. funny. Yeah. Like a dog. And she, and, and so when she was telling us this story and again, she was probably in her sixties at the time, you know, she would do it and we would laugh because she was so cute the way she'd do it. And then she said, and then I, I hit my toe on the pot belly stove or whatever. And she mm. said, I broke my toe. <laughs> So it was just, you know, it was just those cute little things that I remember as a kid, you know, that she was, she would tell us these fun little stories. What a from character. But yeah. Wow. I feel like terrific. I've met her. It's just, uh, she's, she's wonderful. And she's, besides being wonderful and fun and happy, she was able to take that trauma and actually become, I don't know, almost a healer or something. I mean, it seems yeah. like she was able to turn that. Not all of us have that ability. And so it's a tremendous power. And and again, right. I feel like she's living on through the Eastland disaster. We wouldn't have the Eastland Disaster Historical Society, not just without her surviving, but her spirit. Absolutely. And so many times we have said, oh my gosh, we wish she had been here. Mm -hmm. We like to think that she's looking down saying, wow, good job. Well, of course, I can't prove it, but I do think that Bobby is looking down on them and saying, good job, or however you say that in Norwegian, because they really have done quite a service for us. So thank you, Barb. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, Jean, for all the work you did with the Eastland Disaster Historical Society. And personally, I love the story of how this Eastland Disaster Historical Society was born. 
One day they're driving to a relative's house for Thanksgiving and all of a sudden one of them says, somebody needs to do something about this or somebody has to do something about this. And once you say that out loud, somebody better do something about whatever, oftentimes, all the times, nearly you end up being the somebody, the someone. So we have four someones who bothered to do something with this story. And to say I'm indebted to these folks, that doesn't even cover it. And the fact that we were doing similar things at the same time always probably will always fascinate me. Again, it's like what was in the air in the late 90s when I discovered this for the first time and they in turn decided to create this society. I don't know. But the one thing that struck me about what they did was that in 1998, they embraced the technology. The World Wide Web was a brand new thing at one point. And what they decided to do is they got curious and they thought, how can we use this modern technology to share the story, the nearly lost story of this event that happened back in 1915? And so they embraced it. And I've been in IT from around that that time as well. And I do recall that people were terrified of this thing, this World Wide Web thing, this internet thing. And you probably know where I'm going because I'm talking about this in 2023. There have been a lot of new technological changes and they're going really fast. And as much of a a tech lover as I am, it is hard to keep up. But again, what they did is instead of ignoring the technology, they learned to run with it. Ted learned to program a website, but they embraced this technology early. They learned how to work it for good purposes, and I applaud them for that as well. So again, there's just so many wonderful aspects of this story, and I hope that, I always hope again that people aren't just inspired by listening to anything pertaining to this podcast or my book, but that they take action in their own lives. And decide to do something about their own family history, their own history for that matter, write a memoir, whatever you want to do. But the whole thing about what Bobby Onstead did was she told the story over and over and over again. Maybe that was the way she dealt with the trauma, by talking about it, by facing it. I can't speak for Bobby, but it almost seems as if she looked at it and said, I, you're not going to get the best of me. And, and I have complete respect for that. And just as I have respect for my own family who struggled with dealing with what happened because they too had a pile up of tragedies. And so everyone's journey is different. I respect everyone's journey. But when you run across someone who has this incredible will of steel to uh, survive and thrive and embrace life again, that's pretty incredible. And I certainly appreciate it. At any rate, that's all for now. I hope you enjoyed this adventure with Barb, and maybe we can coax her back at some point because isn't she fun to listen to? Okay, so take care, and I will talk to you soon. Hey, that's it for this episode, and thanks for coming along for the ride. Please subscribe or follow so you can keep up with all the episodes. For more information, please go to my website. That's www.floweritheriver.com. I hope you'll consider buying my book, available now as audiobook, ebook, paperback, and hardcover, because I owe people money. And I'm just kidding about that. But the one thing I'm not kidding about is is that this podcast and my book are dedicated to the memory of the 844 who died on the Eastland. Goodbye for now.